God's omnipresence. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? And he tells us that he can't go anywhere and escape God's presence. Now, uh, because the nature of some of these studies is a little deeper than others, we kind of summarize what we've been saying to get your mind back into first or second gear, whatever gear you're in. <laughs> and so we said that God's omnipresence is, is that perfection which, whereby God is personally and actively present everywhere in his universe at one and the same moment. We gave you scriptures for that. How can he be present everywhere at once? Because he is spirit. The reason you can't is because you're not spirit. We said we, that God doesn't need space. Space is created for the uh, so that objects God made could have a place to be. You can have space without an object, but you can't have an object without space to put it in. And in order to understand how God does not need space as we conceive space, we must define space as it affects us and as it affects God. We said that God is in another dimension. So we have to use different terms, different concepts, and we are very limited in our concepts and our terminology. Therefore, even to express God's lack of space, as we know space, created space, is almost impossible. You have to think in terms of another dimension. You can't compare it to geographical, mathematical terms. The spiritual dimension, we said, well, we raised a question, uh, what, what would you see or where would you be if you came to the edge of space and could you come to the edge of it and step through to the other side Then would that be heaven? Would that be God's dimension? We said that you can't come to the edge of space because there isn't any edge. And we showed you how that the spiritual dimension permeates the visible, created dimension. We, we can... If we are here, we can't be there. But if you were there, you would be there and here. <laughs> Spirit beings are already here. See, an angel, or a demon for that matter, depending on certain factors, demons are not supposed to be in here, but for sake of making a point, uh, spiritual beings are in both dimensions at once if they choose to be. Uh, that's an oversimplification because they can't always be where they want to be. God, you know, sets limits even there. But the point is that the spiritual dimension is already here. We gave you scriptures for that, Mark 5, 2 Kings 6, and examples out of experience. All right, that's God's domain. That's where we are. So we're taking up there tonight. A lot of you had a lot of questions. It'd be better maybe not to take any more questions and just get through the study tonight and then uh, see what you come out with. Let me say that theological studies, some aspects of it are not the most essential. If you end up saying, I don't understand God's dimension, don't worry about it. That has nothing to do with salvation. It's good that you have the right concept of body, soul, and spirit, but it won't make any difference whether or not you're saved. But it makes a whole lot of difference in whether or not you can interpret the word right and help others. So I'm saying that there's some things you can leave out, but your understanding would be quite limited. You can read books on theology and you won't get into areas that we get into every week, whether it's faith or theology or whatever. And uh, if you want to go deeper with God, you have to understand something more about God than uh, Sunday school lessons give you. So we're taking up where we were, that God's dimension is spirit, that's where we started. But, but, and I suggested this last time, you can't define God's dimension as spacelessness. We said that God, that space is emptiness, and emptiness is not essential to God's existence, that ought to be obvious. What would God need with emptiness to exist? But, now after laying all that foundation, we're coming now to try to understand God's dimension. It, it can't be defined merely as spacelessness. And keep in mind, all, all along, we're limited by human terminology. 
or even things some of us maybe can understand, but there are no words to communicate them, so you have to use words that you put in quotes like that. So if we talk about God's space, we always write it that way. He doesn't have space as we, as we experience it. So there is some form of distance. Now you need to get as much of this as you can. There is some form of distance or separateness even in the spiritual dimension. And I put distance and separateness in quotation marks when I when I'm speaking them, because these are human terminology. This is human terminology, earthly terminology, trying to describe another dimension. It, so I said last week the terms of this dimension don't even fit the other. They're, you've just started a whole new subject in conversation when you get out of the visible realm into the invisible, the material dimension into the spiritual. They're not they're not alike at all but we're limited to language. So we have to put quotation marks around some things to say we don't really mean by distance feet, inches, yards. And yet there is a distance, there is a separation in the spiritual dimension. There's a separation between God and his creation of angels and other spirit beings, even though they're spirits, spiritual. There's separation, or they'd all be one. There's separation between God and the spiritual creation. Now you have to keep that in mind or you've missed all we've said. Absence of, di of distance, even in the spiritual dimension, means identity. Remember the analogy of the king. That the thing, the ingredients, the reason bananas and eggs and flour and sugar and all can exist is because there's distance between them. As soon as you mix them up, they're all one. They've lost their identity because there's no space or distance between them. So even in the spiritual dimension, God and an angel has to keep a distance, quote, unquote. Or it be one. God indwells and fills the Christian, according to his word. The Spirit of God fills us. And yet we're not God, and God's not us. That's Hinduism, absor absorption and absorption in the deity. The Hindu concept is that you become deity. That's salvation. You're absorbed into the deity. For God to maintain his identity and we ours, there must be some form of separateness even in union. Even though he says we are one, John 17, for example, as he and the Father are one, he said, I will that they be one as we are one, yet the Father is the Son, the Son is the Father. And we're not God, and God's not us. So even though... Well, in fact, you can see from the fact that he says we're one and we know we're not one, mathematics, mathematic one, you can begin to see that there, there are different concepts in the spiritual dimension. Even though they use, God must use our language so we can understand. It's not mathematical oneness. Like when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he, yet he turns right around and prays to the Father. So it's not, it's not a mathematical oneness in the Godhead, but a qualitative oneness, one spirit. Eternally expressed as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not three gods. See, right away if you start saying one or two or three, and you've got either absorption in the deity or you've got uh, three gods. Now we've already covered that, so by now we ought to be able to think in terms in which the Bible is speaking. Now the Bible, if it says things, and they don't mean what we mean by them, then we have to find out what they mean. When Jesus said, I am the Father one, we've got abundant scriptures where he shows that they're not one in the sense that he's the Father, the Father is Jesus. So one cannot always mean one mathematically, one in the Bible. So in dealing with space, there must be a separation even in the spiritual dimension. But it's not a separation you can measure in earthly terms. Uh, if that doesn't help you, why well, you'll just have to forget it. Each of the thousands of demons in the Gadarene demoniac, Mark 5, was not affected one iota by the limitations of space. 
They didn't need any space. And nevertheless, each one had his personal identity, a name. You cast demons out of people, there may be sometimes a hundred in a person, each one will have a name. It's a personal being, an individual, separate from all the other demons in that person. And yet they're all in one person. And, uh, well, I related the vision, the woman, well, not a vision, but actual sight of demons in a man last week that she told me about. She saw demons swarming in him like bees. They didn't occupy space. They weren't bumping into one another because right away you're thinking in earthly created terms of space, material terms. See, angels don't bump into one another. They don't, when they come into our dimension, they don't bump into walls. You've got, you've got to think in an entirely different dimension. The wall's there. He sees it. It's real. The angel can go through the door or through the wall. It doesn't matter. Because he isn't bound or limited by our concepts of space. But he thinks of a door as you think of a door, as an opening to walk through. That's why often he walks through. You see, it's in the thought realm. It's reality. But he isn't limited by it. Spiritual space, now that's in quotes, see this space. Spiritual space is defined as that actuality, this is a definition, that actuality which enables God to maintain his separateness. And personal identity from all his creatures. Spiritual space. And we're thinking now of the spiritual dimension in space because we don't have any other term. Spiritual space is that actuality, that reality which enables God to maintain his separateness and his personal identity from all his creatures. Now, while there is a real distinction in the spiritual dimension between all things, it's not to be compared to space-time, the space-time dimension, as we've said many times. Now, it might be compared to the incident, as we've said, of the Gadarene demoniac in Mark 5, where there were countless demons in one man. Here, space, as we experience it, was not essential to their being in that man. Here space is seen to be more distinctional than geographical. It's distinctional rather than mathematical or geographical. Space, then we're saying in the spiritual dimension, is more distinctional than geographical. But it's real. But you don't take tape measures in heaven to measure how far it is from one side of the street to the other. But it's there. The, the, the separation is there. There wouldn't be a street in heaven. There are streets. Well, let me give you an analogy. And this, is, this, is, uh, this will help you to see it. If you don't see it from this analogy, you never will. And as I say, it isn't essential. Uh, in fact, I don't recommend you go out and teach on space. We're teaching you God's space, that is. We're teaching you so that you become a better interpreter of the Word. Uh, we could lay out, outline, God is holy, God is righteous, and just all read a proof. That's generally the way they teach in a Bible school. You know, they say God is righteous, then we look up Scripture, says God is righteous, God is holy, then we look up Scripture, says God is holy. And, and you can quote all that, but uh, someone says... What is being holy? You say, well, now that means, uh, well, what does it mean? Go ahead. I'll give you five minutes to define holiness. And so if you know Hebrew, you know it means, the word holy means to be consecrated, set apart. So it helps to study, doesn't it? So when God says you're holy, he means he sets you apart unto himself because he is holy. 
And only in reference to God do we know the meaning of holiness as, as an ethical term because it means that he is pure, sinless, righteous. But you see, you can't, you can't look at anything else and define holiness except in relation to God. Because holiness as a word means to be separated. So to get its moral or ethical meaning, you have to say, what is God in character? Then that's where you get your ethical meaning. But that isn't what the word means. The word means to be separated, set apart. Because even prostitutes in the Old Testament were called holy. Because the word just means they were consecrated to something. And whatever you're consecrated to makes you either good or bad, you see. So, well, we'll get into holiness later. I hope uh, we're not getting too far ahead of the story. But let me give you the analogy of light to help you understand how God doesn't need space, that all the beings in heaven or in the other dimension are real, but space, you can't, you can't define the dimensions there in terms of our spatial dimensions. See, just as light... Now, you want to get this down. Spirits do not occupy created space. Just as light. Spirits do not occupy created space. Well, I forgot my flashlight, so I'll have to try to use this. But how much space is that light beam taking up? Absolutely none. Yet it's real. God is light, that's what scriptures say. Now, he's not light like that's a light, but he is light. And, and he's, light in a, he's light as light as well as a personal being. But it's not, see, that's created light. When, when scriptures say again and again, God is light, that's not just a figure of speech. Because often when spirit beings are seen, they're seen as, as light creatures made up of spiritual light. Well, anyway, light doesn't have anything in it. It doesn't occupy space. See that? There's a beam there. If we turn out all the lights, well, it's, 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 that isn't a lot of help. But anyway, you know there's a beam there, don't you? Everybody know there's a beam of light there? What's that beam? See, it's a beam. <laughs> if, if, we, if we blew some smoke there, from a fire, <laughs> you'd, you'd see the beam, wouldn't you? All right, now watch another. Here, is that, that's a light, and this is a light, isn't it? Both realities, everybody agree? All right, now watch. I'm going to put one beam of light on the other. What happened? Didn't take any space to put that other light. See, nothing had to move. I could put another light here. I could put one there. I could put 10 million lights right here. Every light would be real, but none would occupy space. That's why all those demons could be in the Gadarene demonia. They were all in one spot, in him. But they don't occupy space. Well, now, you don't get these things out of books. The Lord gives them to me. But, I mean, the, uh, the, the, uh, the understanding and the teaching the Lord gives, you don't get out of books, but the facts are there for people to see if they'll pay the cost of studying. So just as light, spirits do not occupy created space. And as light beams converge, and both can occupy the same location at the same time, so spirits do not need space to exist. Two spirits, if they met, would walk around one another, but they could just as well walk through one another because you can't think in terms of space in the spiritual dimension, but, that, but there is separation. And we just don't have the language to say much more than that. You have to, you have to see, understand some things. They're not terms that you can use to explain them. You see, two lights, these are real lights, See, what can happen in the spiritual dimension can't happen in the created order. See, I can't put that light there. Right away, we're bumping. This, these are created lights. But in the spiritual dimension, you see, there's no, nothing to bump. So what happens in the spiritual dimension is utterly impossible in the natural dimension. It's impossible for natural objects to do what spirits can do. So whether we've got two lights or two million lights, they'll all occupy the same space because they don't need space. 
And yet each keeps its personal distinction, its apartness. But space, as we experience it, is not what separates them. You see, each of those two light beams, and as I say, we can make it 2,000, but let's keep it simple. Each of those two light beams was separate and distinct. Now, you weren't supposed to look at the lights to see what we're saying. These are the material objects. They can't occupy two spaces. You were to think about the two beams. So each of those beams where they met were distinct and separate, but it was not space as we know it or experience it that separates those two light beams. What separated them? Well, this is the key. It's the reality of their personal, individual existence. The very fact that they exist is what makes them distinct. Or if they weren't distinct, then two things wouldn't exist. It'd just be one. See, the very fact they're two angels, though they don't occupy space, yet they are as real as two people are who occupy space because they exist. That's why they're real and distinct. But they don't need space to make them distinct. The very fact that they exist is their distinction. Thus, in the New Jerusalem, in the spiritual realm, the New Jerusalem has dimensions. They're given in Revelation 21. So that means there are real dimensions in the spiritual realm. The angels are separate from God in the spiritual realm. The angels have to move from one place to get to another. But they don't have to move geographically and mathematically. You can't measure how many million miles it is from one side of heaven to the other because there are no miles in heaven. Those are created space, our terms. Created space terms. See, God doesn't have to go somewhere to get everywhere. He doesn't have to go anywhere to be everywhere at once. That's omnipresence. He's already everywhere. But yet the Bible says he sits on a throne in heaven. Jesus sits at his right hand. And yet he doesn't have to go anywhere to be right here. How is he present? He says, in his spirit. Because he's spirit, he's in every believer. He's in the whole universe. Well, don't try to understand it because it's that other dimension. We're in a, it's like ex trying to explain to a six-month-old infant, infant Einstein's theory or advanced calculus. They would just look at you with the mouth open. So in a sense, that's the way we look upon God and his dimension with our mouths open trying to comprehend as much as he'll let us know, but we end up saying with Paul, who can, who can comprehend the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge of God? You see, the only reason I can understand what I understand is that I, I know, I've learned not to relate this dimension to that one. And that's why, again, we can have a strong faith, because we know God is not limited by space, time, or impossibilities. And we don't have to pray off somewhere to find God. He's right, well, he's here inside. He's in the whole room as a person, personality. Person in the sense we've defined it in the study of the Godhead. Our Bible defines it. So dimensions such as length and height and breadth Separation between things are real in the spiritual dimension. But all of these terms must be understood in the dimension in which they're used.
Separation between objects, separation between things, dimensions, height, breadth, length, they're real in the spiritual dimension, but you have to understand those terms in the dimension in which they're used. You can't take a tape or a ruler into heaven to measure things. Even though the Bible gives the dimensions of New Jerusalem, these are spiritual, that is in the spiritual dimension. And those dimensions are real if they're understood in light of that dimension. And again, you have to fall back to the light beams to understand they don't need space to be real, but they're each separate, each distinct. Compare, for example, the many thoughts and ideas and facts in your mind right now, tens of thousands of facts and, uh, that you've accumulated over the years, all separate, all real, but they don't occupy any space in your head. <laughs> See, it's a different dimension. Now you can understand that, can't you? Well, if you can understand that, that's why don't try to relate the finite created order to God's order. That's why people get so confused. They're praying off to God. He's so far off. Oh, he's so far off today. I can't reach him. He's living right in their heart. That is, if he's a Christian. You don't have to go anywhere to talk to God. You ought to walk down the street talking with him. Not having to stop and kneel or go to church and kneel in an order. Like one brother, I want to pray for him to receive the Holy Spirit in the car. Oh, not in the car, not in the car. I want to receive that at church. <laughs> he thought that's where God was. That he wasn't anywhere else. Well, if you could see your thoughts... If you could see your ideas, if you could see those tens of thousands of facts you've accumulated over the idea, uh, over, the, uh, over the years, if you could see all of those, you'd see them as separate, distinct facts. Like you know two and two is four, you know that up here. You know that color is uh, brownish, whatever it is. <laughs> you know you got what color clothes you got on. You know approximately how far it is home. You know how many windows in your house, you know, you can know just millions of facts. And if you could look, if those facts could be, and they're real, if they could be seen, you'd see them as separate and distinct, every one of them, but you'd never see them separated by space. You wouldn't see space between them. Well, I hope we're coming through. <laughs> See, that shows you how millions of things can exist that don't need a bit of space to exist. And that's the real realm, not this one. This one's finite, limited. I can't walk through there. I have to go there. I'm very limited. So don't compare, don't say this is the real, this is the created. It'll pass away. And then there'll be a new heavens and new earth, spiritual, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Some have seen in vision where, well, I, I don't tend to get into this area. If I do, we'll never get through. But uh, as in the case of Jesus, he would walk through a door or he could walk or just appear in the room. He didn't walk through a wall. He just appeared. How? He just willed himself to be there. And so uh, I, I've read where some have been shown some of these things in the Spirit, some spirit-filled Christians, and it harmonizes with that same idea. That in the spiritual dimension, you will yourself to be somewhere. You're not limited by space and time. You, th you think New York, you're in New York. That's a finite example because it won't be in New York. But uh, <clears throat> God doesn't have to, uh, uh, to, to go anywhere to be everywhere, as we said. Now, we would have to think the thought, but he's already there because he knows everything. He is everywhere. He's all-wise, all-knowing, so he's just everywhere. See, his, we'll get into that next. His omniscience can't be separated from his omnipresence. Omniscience means he's all-wise, all-knowing. The reason he is because he's everywhere, and the reason he's everywhere is because he's all-knowing. See, all of God's attributes go together. But... Uh, the fact that we won't, won't have to catch planes or trains to go anywhere in the new dimension. 
means that we're dealing with different concepts and terms. You will to be where you are, because this is the real you anyway, the will, the inner man, the person of, the spiritual aspect of your being is the real person. And that's what causes this, this gives locomotion, locomotion to, the, um, to the physical part. See, the body doesn't start walking. I guess you know that. I don't, the body didn't say, do that. It, me said that, the I, the real part of me. And this just expresses this because I'm in a, in a physical dimension. Um, if I were in the spiritual dimension, I could will that Bible to rise, and it would just rise and be where I wanted it. But now I can will it right now, but I have to put my will into action. But you see, it's not my body that raised it. It was my will that raised it. My body is simply the, the leverage, the power that gives expression or meaning to my, to my will. And so without the body, without the limitations of the space-time context in which we live, then the will, the person, wills to do or to be in that dimension. And it's the same. Uh, since he's not, uh, since there are no space-time limitations, then he is where he wants to be, as within the confines of what God permits. It's like I say, an angel doesn't have to go somewhere to get somewhere. He wills himself to be there. But still, there, where he is and where he's going are not the same. But doesn't have to... And of course, when the Bible speaks of... of Going one place to another, even the spiritual dimension, remember God has to express in terms in which we understand. And uh, all of those distinctions and separateness and all of that is real in that dimension, but it's not bound by time, space as we experience it. The reason God, well... Uh, God or angels to a degree or Satan, the reason they can know the future and of course Satan our created beings in the spiritual dimension are limited to what they can know about the future but the reason they can is because they're not involved in time. See, they can see things as they are and will be up to a limit. Only God knows the future perfectly but uh, that's another realm. But the point is that you can see how that Satan, many times through fortune tellers and spiritualist mediums, well, like Jean Dixon, she, most of her prophecies come true. And any Christian knows she's got her plug in down below. But how are they coming true? It's because Satan can see the future up to a point. Now, she misses it sometimes. That's not always because Satan missed it, but because he couldn't communicate perfectly with her. You can turn that around. That's the same reason God can't show us some things because we've got the flesh in the way. And uh, you got more in the Spirit. He can show you more. All right, let's try to sum up tonight. Omnipresence means, finally, personal presence. Omnipresence means personal presence. And this emphasis upon God's personal presence is necessary to avoid the error of some who say that God is present only in power and wisdom, that his being remains on the throne in heaven. Jeremiah 23, for example. Now, that's, uh, that error was held by Socinius. We remember we studied Socinius in connection with the Trinity. Socinius, S-O-C-I-N-I-U-S. He denied the Trinity, that is, the triune nature of God, denied the deity of Christ. He followed Arius, who was the first to say that Jesus was not eternal and divine. So the Socinian area, Socinus, the Socinian error, Socinius said that God was present only in wisdom and power, that he himself stayed in heaven, that his being remained in heaven. But the scriptures refute that. We've already given most of them, but you might look at a couple again to see what we mean. That 
that there's a, sometimes a fine line between error or heresy and truth. Again, that's why you study, so you don't get caught up in those subtle errors that are on the increase in our day. God isn't just present in his wisdom or power. He is present. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? In other words, am I just in heaven and not afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? So he fills heaven and earth. That means he's omnipresent, everywhere present. Psalm 139. Psalm 139 shows both his uh, omniscience, his wisdom and knowledge is everywhere, and he himself is everywhere. So Sinus and, uh, and others, and some who are evangelical, come very close to following the error of Socinus by saying God is just dynamically present. That's kind of a dangerous term to use. God is personally present. And here we see a separation between the presence of God's wisdom. His wisdom is present everywhere and his knowledge. But so is he present with that. Psalm 139. Now, I'm going to wait till you turn there. I know you have a lot of writing to do, but uh, some things you have to see to fully understand what we're saying. The error here is that some hold God is present only in his power and wisdom, that his being, person, remains in heaven. Verse 2 shows that he is present everywhere in knowledge and wisdom. Thou knowest my downsitting, my uprising, David says. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou comfortest my, pass, my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. And this he said, you know all about me from afar off. So he has knowledge present is what the argument would be and that he isn't present. He says, you're acquainted with all my ways. That's knowledge. There's not a word in my tongue, but that, lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. So that is his, the presence of his knowledge, wisdom, but if you stop there, then that could prove the point. But notice, he himself is present also. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? That ought to be plain enough. If I send up to heaven, your spirit and presence are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, your spirit and presence are there. If I take the wings of morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me. Thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from me, and so on. So God is both present in knowledge and person. God's personal presence on the earth, God's personal presence in the created order, is clearly seen in his appearance to Adam. He walked with him in the garden, the Bible says. That's a person of presence. He appeared to Abraham. He appeared and talked with Moses. He said he was personally present two to two or three times in the Old Testament that he was personally present, enthroned on the ark in the Holy of Holies. He appears again and again in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, and he receives worship, so we know it's God, because angels cannot be worshipped. He was personally present in the Incarnation. He came to earth as a man. He came as Lagos and became a man. That's what we mean, of course. So these visible personal appearances of God in his created order confirm his invisible personal presence in the same order. If he can be visibly present, then he can be invisibly present. That's what the Bible says. Omnipresence, everywhere present. 
Two terms need defining before we leave this subject and go on to omniscience. Two terms. You run into them in your reading and theology. And one is transcendence. Transcendence. And the other is immanence. Opposites. Immanence. Now both of these are both of these are aspects of his omnipresence, is why we're looking at them. Uh, transcendence to, to transcend something means uh, it's completely other than whatever you're comparing it to. If I say uh, light transcends darkness, you see they're opposites. And imminence means intimate presence, just the opposite to transcendence. Transcendence is completely opposite to whatever you're talking about. Imminence means it is practically identified with whatever you're talking about. It is definitely present, not absent. God's imminence in man is the Holy Spirit. See, he indwells us. That's called his imminence. Now, let's uh, look at those terms separately. First of all, transcendence. God's transcendence means his apartness, his otherness. He is completely apart from man and his creation. He is completely other than what he created. He is completely apart from and other than man. You never know it from some of the teaching where Jesus is little more than big brother. You see, the Bible says, we're saying he's completely other than what we are. The Bible says he is spirit. No, Nothing or no one is spirit but God. Now, you have to get a hold of that or you get mixed up on these erroneous concepts being taught that man is spirit. You'll search in vain to find where man's a spirit in the Bible. Man has spirit. Man is soul. But anyway, the thing that makes God other than man, God is spirit. The Bible says we are flesh. All flesh is as grass that perishes. God is spirit, we are flesh. He is holy, we are sinful. Now I'm thinking of mankind when I say that, not a Christian. He is spirit, we are flesh. He is holy, we are sinful. He is infinite, we are finite. And on and on and on. You can make such comparisons to show God's transcendence. But his transcendence is not to be thought of spatially as space separating him from man. See, we're back to our concept of space. His transcendence is not to be thought of spatially, but morally and spiritually. He's completely apart from man spiritually and morally, but not spatially. Spatially, he's omnipresent. He's right here, spatially. If you're going to use space terms, then he's right here. But if you're going to use the terms in which we compare him with his creation, then they are completely at opposite ends of poles. So his transcendence is a moral and ethical and spiritual transcendence. It's a transcendence of holiness, of his divine nature. He is other than what we are. And it never could ever be expressed any better. He is other than what man is. Now let me give you a couple of scriptures on that. Uh, Psalm 113, 5 and 6. Isaiah 31, verse 3. Among many, 
that would prove the point, but those are two clear ones. You want to listen to those or turn to them. Psalm 113, 5 and 6. Now this will show you, there are a lot of passages you can cite, but I like this one. It shows you how God is completely other than what man is. Who is like unto the Lord our God? Who dwelleth on high? Who? He's raising a question. Verse 4, we can go back one verse. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. See, God's glory is even above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Now look at this. God has to humble himself to behold the things that are in heaven. <laughs> as well as here. That's a, see, he created everything in heaven. Except himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always were. Remember back our teaching on the Godhead? God didn't need anything because he was complete in himself. If he wasn't, then he couldn't be God because God has to be perfect in every aspect. So the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. They love each other in the communion of the Holy Spirit. So they were complete in them. In, he was complete in himself. So he has to humble himself, verse 6, to even look at what he created in heaven, the angels. He does. He is so other than anything he made. He has to humble himself to look at the highest creature in heaven. Oh, I'll tell you, the Bible has a lot to say that you've not been taught, friends, about God. God is so completely other than what we are, that's why grace is so great, that he has to humble himself to look at a, a righteous being in heaven. Simply because it's created, it's finite. If you can understand what God is, then anything he creates, he has, by his own choice, uh, bound himself to that because it can never cease to exist. I'm thinking about a spiritual being now. It's, it is immortal. Angels are many. See, there's something bigger in creation than just making things. That God, when he condescended to make man and spiritual beings, then he couldn't just erase them like if you make a mistake on paper or wash it out. It's there, immortal. It'll spend eternity somewhere, that being. So anything he makes, you see, has to look down on it because it's finite, even spiritual beings. Then Isaiah 31.3 shows God is other than that man or anything he creates. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. Now that's the typical Hebrew parallelism. You can put the first, last, and the last first, and it says the same thing. The book of Proverbs is filled with parallelism, saying the same thing in two different ways. So you can turn around and say that, that God is spirit and man is flesh. And horses are but, well, name a horse, say, uh, Arabian horse is but a horse and not God. You see, in other words, you can turn that parallelism, parallelism around. He's saying man is simply flesh, not spirit. Obviously, that's what he's saying. Then eminence, the eminence of God is just the opposite. You have to take both together to understand God's omnipresence. God is not to be thought of as a creator who simply stands outside his creation and looks in upon it occasionally as deism taught. God is not a disinterested spectator who occasionally passes by this little bubble in the spiritual dimension, as we showed you last week. You don't have to go anywhere to get into the spiritual dimension. It's already here. Remember, we're just a bubble in God's spiritual dimension. Now, I have to put lines around the spiritual dimension to show you what I'm talking about, but there are no boundaries to the spiritual dimension. It's just everywhere. Not in feet and miles. It's, it's a reality. It, its existence is it's a reality. 
And so God isn't a disinterested bystander who occasionally looks in upon his creation. God's eminence is his omnipresence. He is everywhere. He is active in everything. He's even active in good and bad, but he's he's against the bad, but he's active against it. So God is not outside anything that's going on. He's either promoting it or opposing it. That's his eminence. Now that isn't pantheism, as we've already pointed out, which is God is everything. No, this is different. God is stands over against his creation. He's other than what it is. He's transcendent. But he's imminent in his personal presence and activity. The, the Bible shows the entire universe, including every creature, is moment by moment sustained by God. By his spirit. If he, were with the, if he were to withdraw his presence, his eminence, his presence for a brief fraction of a second, all life would perish. The universe would collapse. Colossians 1.17 says, Christ created all things and by him all things are held together. It doesn't say that in English, but it does in the Greek. By him all things are held together. I think the English is by him all things consist. If God were, were just to withdraw his presence for the brief fleeting part, one millionth of a second, everything would collapse. He upholds all things, we're told, by the word of his power. He speaks it. Exists. As long as God's saying it exists, it will exist. So he is actively present in every atom, A-T-O-M, every atom that he created. And there are trillions of them on the head of a pen. So compare that, how many there must be in an infinite universe. And such a beautiful order, how God has... All things are made up of atoms. Atoms are trillions of them. can be trillions in that little circle I made there. Trillions. And that's the nucleus of an atom. That means it has, it's like an egg. It has the yolk in it. And it's made up of protons and neurons, but we'll skip those. They don't mean anything. Protons. And, and, and whirling at tremendous rates of speed around that atom are electrons different numbers would be different orbits, just like the earth going around the sun. Now remember, just on the point of that pencil, pen, there are trillions of atoms. See, everything's made up of atoms. And just a speck of anything has trillions. And uh, these electrons are whirling around it at tremendous rates of speed. And of course, different, different kinds of uh, Material objects have different kinds of atoms that they're made up of. That's why some things are thick and some things are soft and hard and so forth. Like a carbon atom is made up of six protons. This is a little academic, but I want you to get the point. Six protons and six electrons. They match. The electrons match the protons. That's what keeps them spinning. And the reason that you can conduct electricity through a wire is that there are ways to move some of these atoms off the outer shell and it'll take another one off of the one by it and it gets a flow of current going at speed of light, of course. But think, trillions on the head of a pin and the universe is almost infinite in size. And God is controlling every one of those little things you can't see. <laughs> And he's, he's and the scriptures say Colossians 1:17. He's holding all things together. He means this is the way he's doing it. See, the reason that'll hold its shape is because it's made up of certain kinds of atoms that'll do that. You could make that out of water. C 
see, you could put that much water up here and you know it would be everywhere. Even butter would melt. If you don't believe it, stand up here. <laughs> but uh, God is holding it all together. And this is, of course, like, uh, like the universes themselves. That's the way they operate, spinning around, orbiting around one another. But, uh, and of course, God lets us see certain things, but when you get right down to the infinite particle of that, they really can't find anything but power. That big, and that's God. That, that when he spoke the universe into existence, he didn't have any atoms, dirt and mud and rocks and water and trees to make a world out of. He just said exist. And he just keeps saying exist, and because God is so infinitely wise and powerful, this is what is exist, things are existing out of. Now, we're not thinking about the spiritual part of us, because remember, it doesn't occupy space. That's that other dimension. But the created order is made up, apparently, of things that exist simply because God says exist. But there's really nothing there, except energy. Now, those who go a little deeper in scientific studies uh, admit that and see that. No, I mean, that's just a basic fact. That behind the atom, really, the atom is, is just something moving in the form of power or energy. So that post there is made up of atoms, but it's moving at such a slow rate of speed, it, it holds its shape. And like smoke, uh, the atoms are so thinly... Uh, devise that you see it's not very dense and water is a little denser and you get into steel and that's more atoms of a different kind and so forth but it's atoms that hold things together but what's behind an atom? God so uh, that's that is uh, as far as we're concerned they're real you know we as I say if a trillion of those will be on the head of a pin uh, and then there's so many trillions trillion trillions of them in say this pulpit uh, it's real to us whether or not actually if you could get it down to its least particle there'd be nothing there but energy it's real to us and that's the way God made it so it would be solid but he's there holding it together nevertheless however you can explain it now his eminence is seen in another way in, inside man in two ways by the Holy Spirit if he's a Christian I'm thinking, of course, always in terms of spiritual Christian. And if he's not a Christian, God's eminence is seen there in two ways, his image and conscience. You see, there's no man that doesn't have a conscience. Romans 2 says that. Well, that's God's eminence. James says not to curse men because they're created in the image of God. So he's talking about men, not whether they're Christian or not. All men are in the image of God. That's what makes them men. So God is eminent in his image in man, in, his, in man's conscience. He's eminent even in the animal order because his spirit is in the animal order. Ecclesiastes 3.21 When an animal dies, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. Psalm 104, verses 24 to 30 says that God just breathes on things they live. He takes back his spirit, his breath or spirit, same word in the Hebrew, takes back his spirit, they die. So God is causing the little daisy to bloom. It just doesn't happen because you plant a seed. It happens because God is breathing on it. Psalm 104, 24 to 30. So in conclusion... By God's transcendence, he maintains his personal identity. By his imminent, he is omnipresent. And that's how you put it all together.